Good evening. Well, I'm not going to try to follow that. Uh, my name is Will Scott. Uh, I graduated from Cary Academy in 2003. Um, and I'm going to keep this talk short. And so I'm going to dedicate it to two people. My, my grandmother, Ann Fyroar Scott, who told me that brevity is the soul of wit. So, and uh, to Carol Hamilton, who was my debate coach. And I think a lot of y'all probably remember her. So, you know, I used to go back and see Ms. Hamilton after I graduated, and she would say these things to you that you, you did not know how to respond to. So you, you'd come in, and you'd tell her how you were doing, and then she'd look at you right in the eye, and she'd say, are you making a difference? And you'd sort of, I, I am not now, but I soon hope to be making a difference sort of a thing. And, and uh, so this is going to be a short attempt um, to talk to Ms. Hamilton and hopefully convince her that we're doing that now. So y'all are probably wondering, you know, what the heck is a river keeper, right? So if you're a river keeper, your job is to protect this. Right, this is the Yadkin River. I'm the Yadkin River keeper. It's the second largest river in North Carolina, right? Drains 7,200 square miles. It's the only one that's smaller than it is the Cape Fear. And over 700,000 people get their drinking water out of it every day, right? And so my job as a river keeper is to make sure that that water is fishable, swimmable, and drinkable. Right? Those are the basics. Uh, if you look back at where the Riverkeeper movement came from, it started in the 1960s on the Hudson River. There was a group of folks there who had a problem with a power plant that was going to be built on the river. And they didn't know what to do about it. This was before all of our modern environmental laws. No Clean Air Act, no Clean Water Act, no National Environmental Policy Act. So you didn't have any tools to fight back against that. So they picked one young man who was a fisherman in that town. These were fishing villages in the Hudson River. And they told him, we don't have time to deal with this. We're all doing our jobs. You be our river keeper. You figure this out. And you come back and tell us what we can do to stop this thing. Right? And so now today, um, there are over 300 water keeper organizations all across the world. Right? So more than half of those are abroad now. So this is our executive director. This is Mark Yagi in Wilmington earlier this year. Over 300 water keepers, so river keepers, bay keepers, lake keepers, got together in Wilmington to talk about what we're doing and how we can better protect water across the world. If you look at the movement, it's growing the fastest right now in Southeast Asia, places like Bangladesh, and in places like China. Because right? we're here in the United States, so when we turn on our tap, we assume that we can drink the water that comes out of that without worrying about it. Right? And that's something that a lot of people in this world do not have the luxury of. So while this is something that started in the U.S., it's not just guys with me, like me, with beards out in canoes doing this, <laughs> right? This is deadly serious to people all across the world. So I'm going to tell you two stories. I'm going to tell you one story about work that we've been doing for the past two years, and then I'm going to ask you to help me with something in the future. So this is Bryant and Sherry Gobble. Uh, I met them when I first started being a river keeper in 2014. This is them looking out their backyard, and that's a coal ash pond in front of them. Have any of you guys ever heard of coal ash? Yeah. All right, so the brief version is that when you burn coal, there's, some, there's things that are left over, right? Especially the parts that won't burn, like metals. And the way that we've disposed of that, of these hundreds of millions of tons a year of industrial waste, is that we put it in ponds like this that are along the banks of rivers. There's nothing on the bottom of those ponds, like there is for your, your municipal landfill, to keep the metals in that water from leaching out and into the groundwater, right? So when I came on at the Adkin Riverkeeper, we were helping folks like Bryant and Sherry test their well water, right? And what we found was that there were abnormally high levels of several metals that are associated with coal ash in their well, including hexavalent chromium. Have any of y'all ever heard of that? Any of y'all ever seen Aaron Brockovich? Aaron Brockovich, hexavalent chromium was what they had in their water there. Right? It's a much lower level here, thank goodness, but it's still high enough that they say it's a genotoxic carcinogen, meaning that it actually breaks down your genes and causes you to have cancer if you're exposed to it over a long period of time. Uh, so we went out into this community. This is me and my dog, Dash, who came along with me a fair bit of the time. And we tested Peel's wells. We went to the river, and we tested the banks of the river. And what we found is that both in the wells and in these what we call seeps, or these leaks along the banks of the river, um, the, the water was full of these metals that we associate with coal ash. Right? And so part of our job as river keepers is to try to stop something when we find out that there's a problem. 
right? So I'm an attorney, that's what I was trained as. And so we brought a lawsuit under the Clean Water Act against Duke Energy. Now, we have two full-time employees in my organization. Duke Energy is a $50 billion Fortune 250 company, right? And their position then, and their position today, is that there is no problem with the coal ash ponds here at Buck and that they are not doing anything wrong, right? So, we, we bring a lawsuit against them, we go out, we draw, we draw samples, we work with the media, because this is not just a problem here, right? Coal ash is something that is found all across the country. We're only addressing it here in North Carolina because we had a spill on the Dan River. Do any of y'all remember that? Super Bowl Sunday, 2014, February 2nd, about 40,000 tons of ash shot out of a broken stormwater pipe and into the river. Right. So that led us to start looking at these ash ponds by the Yadkin. So this is a, a film crew that came down from New York because there are people across the country that are trying to figure out their states aren't addressing this problem like we are. They haven't had a disaster like the Dan River spill, and so they aren't looking at it. So there are communities all across the country that live on well water next to these ponds, haven't had their wells tested, and nobody's really doing anything about it. Right. So that's a big part of why it's important to do what we're doing. Uh, the good news is that we kept at this for two years. Uh, in April 2015, over 70 families around this site got letters from the state of North Carolina telling them not to drink the water that was in their wells. Right? And when that happened, this, this community, which was called Dukeville, which was a company town, decided that they wanted to do something about this. Right? And so all of a sudden, we had a lot of support from the community where before people had really doubted the things that we were telling to them. Right? So... You, we've been going through this for two years now. When we get to this fall, this September, we go to federal court mediation with Duke Energy, and we sit down, and they say, your lawsuit has no merit. However, we are going to do the thing that we've been saying for two years that we are not going to do. We are going to excavate all the ash out of these unlined pits, and we're going to build a recycling plant so that it can be processed back into fly ash and used in concrete where those metals can't escape. Right? So... That, for me, is a story of what river keepers do. This is why we're here. These are communities that would not have a voice otherwise, that have serious problems, that threaten the health of, of their communities, of their neighbors, of their children, and that we have to try to work with them and use whatever resources we can leverage, whether it's the media, the best technology available, pro bono legal help, to try to solve those problems for them. So that's what we do. Why is this relevant to you all? Great, we're out here on the river in a canoe. Uh, the second thing that I want to talk to you all about is watersheds, right? Most of us don't think of ourselves as living in a watershed, right? We think of ourselves as living in Cary or Wake County or the state of North Carolina. But I'm here to tell you that our watersheds are one of the things that define every aspect of our life even if we don't think about it. The power that is running this building right now comes from a coal power plant that is then putting ash into ponds along someone's river, right? The water that we drink here in Cary mainly comes from Jordan Lake, right? We don't often make that connection. And so what, what I would encourage all of you all to do is to try to think of yourselves when these issues come up as citizens of your watershed, not just as of your community, of your school, of your company, or, or whoever else you might generally associate yourself with. And if you reach out to your local river keeper or to your, your local watershed organization, our job is not just to bring cases like the one we just did. It's to do education work and to try to work with people so they can better understand the natural community that we live in. Right? I know that Cary Academy is a wonderful place. Right? It brings people in from all over the country. There are families here from all over the world. You can learn Chinese. You can learn to play the violin. All, all kinds of great things. But what I'm saying to you all is that when we leave here, we still are rooted in a place. Our water still comes from somewhere. And we can't change that. So that's something that we have to continue to acknowledge if we want to be real citizens of our place and citizens of our community. So the challenge for you all is this. This is North Carolina in 2000. You can see where it's green, that's forest, essentially. The closer it gets to red, those are developed areas. Now, the reason this is important from a watershed perspective is that when you cut down a forest and when you put a parking lot on it or you put a building on it, it no longer soaks up and absorbs water. That water runs off, right? So that means that the river is going to flood more quickly and there's going to be droughts more frequently because the water's not releasing slowly over time. So when you all think about the effects that climate change are going to have on a place like this, the things that we know, that there's going to be greater variability, more floods and more droughts, the built environment that we create and that we choose to live in is going to compound those factors. So here's what North Carolina is going to look like in 2030. Right? Okay. There's 2000. There's 2030. Right? So all of our decisions 
play into this, right? Where we choose to live, where we choose to work, the way that we build our communities over the next generation in a serious way is going to impact the quality of the water that we drink, and also it's going to impact people downstream. I'm sure that you all read about Hurricane Matthew that just happened, right? We're in the headwaters here, right? We're in a good place. But how if we choose to build in these environments and we choose to cover all of what used to be forest with our growth, then that water is going to run off that much faster, and that's going to be the problem of people downstream. So, that's what I want to leave you all with, is that please think for yourselves, if you can, not just as folks who are associated with Cary Academy or, you know, people who live in the town of Cary, but as citizens of your own watershed. Thank you.